dense vegetation, the horrors of biting insects and venomous snakes make the jungle the ideal place to build a prison. A hundred years ago, in this part of the Costa Rican rainforest, the authorities built a penal colony, capitalising on the inmates' fear and loathing for the jungle. Every time I come to the rainforest, there's a fantastic sense of anticipation because the forest is the most wonderful place to be. When I get in there, I really feel alive. About 18 kilometers southwest of here, we've got a base camp. That's what I'm heading for. But in this terrain, travel isn't going to be easy. I reckon it's gonna take the best part of two days to get there. I'm due to meet an expert in jungle medicine at our base camp. I'm carrying all I need for the trek, but I'll also show you how it's possible to survive here with nothing more than a machete. The diversity of life here never ceases to amaze me. This palm is quite incredible. It has the ability to move its centre of gravity towards the light. That's why the locals call it the walking palm. And just down here, there's kapok. That can be really handy for lighting your fire. See this downy material from the seed case? If you collect some of that together and strike sparks onto it, hey presto, flames. I've come to the extreme southwest tip of Costa Rica in Central America, to a region called the Osa Peninsula, an area I've never explored before. This bit of jungle has been described as the most biologically diverse place on Earth, with at least 30 million different species of insects. I know the name of every type of tree in Britain, but I give up here. There are just too many to count. The only problem with navigating in rainforests is the trees. You can't see out. Have a look at the map and I'll show you what I mean. In this area here, there's over 100 square kilometers with nothing but trees, hills and the odd river. So how do I know where I am? Well, the way I do it is to maintain a thread back to where I started. And that thread is made by measuring the angles of the trails using my compass and measuring distance by counting my paces using this handy counting device. That means I know exactly where I am on the map. There are very few trails in the jungle and certainly none where I'm going. And if you get lost, Chances are you'll never find your way out. I reckon I've come about four and a half kilometers. That means that at this sort of pace, I should be in base camp by sometime in the early afternoon tomorrow. Jungle hiking is hot, sticky work. And it's hardly surprising today the temperature's in the upper 80s and there's 90% humidity. So of course, I'm sweating buckets and when you sweat buckets, you've got to drink buckets. One of the old jungle tricks is to get water out of vines like this one. <sighs> Lovely. Not all vines can be used like this. What you have to check for is that the 
liquid that comes out of it is clear, not milky, not yellow, not red, but clear. It doesn't sting your hand, and when you taste it, it doesn't burn your mouth. If it meets all those criteria, it's safe to drink. Heat exhaustion can be a killer in the jungle. It's so hot and steamy that your sweat doesn't evaporate, so your body temperature can go haywire. That's why I take every opportunity to cool down. If your body temperature goes much above 40 degrees, you can suffer delirium and convulsions, fall into a coma and even die. In jungle survival, food isn't a big priority. As long as you've got water, you can live three weeks without food, though I'll eat anything I can get my hands on. This is the heart of palm. And you keep peeling it down through the woody layers to the tender core, which is absolutely delicious. And you eat your way back, when you find a woody bit, you peel it down again and eat the soft inner parts. Lovely. Well, that's been a windy old path. But I'm quite happy. I think I've come about nine kilometres, which means it'll be an easy journey to get to camp tomorrow. But now, I think about 4 pm, it's time to set up camp before it gets dark. Because in the jungle, the sun seems to go straight out. It's like God turns off the lights. When I'm hiking in the jungle, I always use a simple system. A lightweight tarpaulin to keep the rain off and a hammock to get me off the ground away from snakes and wild animals. The most important piece of equipment is a mosquito net. I've had malaria twice, a truly miserable experience best avoided. I always use insect repellents with high concentrations of DEET as well as taking anti-malarial drugs. Oh, it's great. Lovely to take the weight off your feet at the end of a good day's hike. But unfortunately, I can't put my feet up just yet. I've got firewood to collect and dinner to put on. I can tell you something, I'm hungry. Wood in the rainforest is often wet, so finding dry tinder can be very difficult indeed. So what I do is I always carry a little bag like this with me in the rainforest. And in here, I've got a lighter and some little bits of rubber tire cut into thin strips. Doesn't matter if that gets wet and that'll burn really well to start my fire off. That amazing sound is a howler monkey. It's experiences like these that keep drawing me back to the rainforest. But of course, to the uninitiated, a sound like that, coupled with the gloom and darkness of the forest, can make the whole place seem intimidating. In fact, on my way in here, I met a Costa Rican park ranger who told me a very sad story about a husband and wife that came hiking in here not so long ago. They'd only been on the trail for about an hour and they decided to leave it and go into the forest and their wife twisted her ankle. Well, only an hour from the ranger station, naturally, her husband set off back for help, but he made a critical error. He forgot to note down exactly where she was. It took them three weeks to find her. By then, she was dead. It's about six o'clock in the morning and the sun is already hot enough to start making me sweat. But it's great to wake up in the jungle. You feel fresh and alive and everything around you is just buzzing with activity. 
It's also good to use a camp like this because it's very easy to put up and to strike. Fantastic, look at that boa up there. Now that's a constricting snake. He's not gonna give me a poisonous bite. Mind you, there are plenty of other snakes around here you've got to be mighty careful of, particularly in amongst the leaf litter. That's where the deadly fertile ants likes to hide. That's the one the locals fear most. So whenever I'm stepping around logs, I step on them, not over them, just in case he's just underneath. Well, here we are, base camp. Took me a bit longer to get here than I expected. Haha, <laughs> my chance to get my own back. There's the crew. Look at them, sweethearts. Here are the box nets that they'll be sleeping in. And as you can see, they like to travel really light. Let's have a look over here. This is the living area to the camp. Oh yes, as I guessed, they're playing backgammon while I've been slogging through the rainforest. Lovely. Now here's a top tip for the rainforest. If you're going to go into the jungle, go with a doctor. This is Dr. John Walden. He's a specialist in tropical medicine with over 30 years of experience in the Amazon basin. Hi, John. Hi, Ray. How about a beer? Sounds perfect. Trust the doctor to come to the rescue. There you go. Great. We all ready? Yeah. Good. When many people think of the tropics, they think of tropical diseases and they conjure up thoughts of the classic, the obligatory photo of a fellow whose scrotum was so big he had to carry it around in a wheelbarrow. And if not that, then something horribly disfiguring, something mutilating, such as Yaws, Gangosa. Then there are things, things out there that can get you, such as the much maligned Kanjidu. This is a little matchstick-sized catfish has the nasty habit of swimming up in your urethra when you urinate underwater. You know, if you, if you live long enough and travel far enough, about everything your mother ever told you comes true, you know. If, if you have the misfortune of having this actually enter your urethra, it's definitely not a good thing to have. A surgery uh, most likely would be required. The way you keep from having this problem is one, don't urinate under the water, and two, wear a tight bathing suit. You have a number of really aggressive spiders in, in the American tropics, uh, such as the banana spider. Uh, that's actually my foot and the spider that bit me. I did a very foolish thing, and I didn't shake out my boots. Uh, and I stuck my foot in, and that's what was waiting for me. And, the most exquisite pain I've ever had in my life. I've actually passed two kidney stones in my life. This was infinitely uh, worse than, than that. I had a sensation in my left cheek as though it, it felt like when someone does that to you. But it was almost as though I had walked into a spider web or, or, or hair. Some of my hair was onto my face and I kept brushing it away, you see. The venom was doing this. But by the next morning, I actually was fine and trekked for 12 hours the next day. So. By far the most important disease in the tropical world, by far, is malaria. This is a, a little uh, Chachi Indian girl who's in a coma. Uh, she has cerebral malaria uh, and the child is uh, uh, near death. I, as I recall, the good news on this is that uh, through uh, intravenous uh, therapy, she, she actually lived. Malaria can look very much like uh, the flu. Uh, the diagnosis must be made rapidly uh, because you can go from being a sick to severe headache to to confuse to a coma to death uh, in, in short order fortunately there are drugs that you can take you can sleep in a mosquito net um, that's a very good thing because not only does a mosquito net uh, actually keep uh, the mosquitoes from you they tend to keep bats from from biting you vampire bats uh, transmit rabies for example and uh, and sleeping in uh, a mosquito net, uh, unless it's right up against you, uh, often will discourage the, uh, the bats from, from making contact with your uh, skin. 
Then, of course, you have uh, snakes, you have ferret -alants, you have bushmasters. The only thing I know to deal with snakes is this, is put a guide in front of you who was raised in the jungle, and if anyone can see the snake, that person will. You will not see the snake that's going to bite you. As far as treatment, if you can get out and get to some place where they can uh, give you appropriate high doses of antivenom, um, then that, that uh, is, is what must be done. Well, we've seen a number of uh, health problems that, that really, if, if you were the sort of person that wanted to dwell on these, uh, uh, you know, it could it sort of ruin your day. So there we go. Well, with all this base camp equipment, we could quite happily live in the jungle for months. But imagine the nightmare scenario of losing a rucksack, perhaps while crossing a stream, a situation that happens just too frequently. How could I cope with only the things I had about my person? Well, I'm not on a day hike now. I've got to survive here. And the first rule of survival is to stop Think about your situation and make a plan. Anything but panic. My basic plan is to stop here for the night and make a camp. And I reckon this bit of rainforest is going to give me everything I need. Without a machete, my chances of survival would be slim. And an ordinary knife is no substitute. Lianas like this are the natural rope of the forest. And I'm going to take this little one to help me tie my shelter together. I'm going to leave the big one up there so that we don't denude the forest. The shelter I'm building works just like my tarp and hammock, with a bed to keep me off of the ground away from the creepy crawlies, and a big roof to keep the rain off. And I'm making that with this simple lattice work of poles and cross members made from lianas. These are fantastic materials, but they're so flexible of being able to use ordinary conventional knots, starting with a timber hitch and finishing here with a round turn and two half hitches. To thatch my shelter, I'm going to use these, the fronds from the sweeter palm but I've got to be careful because the locals have told me that this is where you often find eyelash pit vipers. The reason I put the two layers of liana on is so that I can lock these palm fronds in place with their stem like that. Jungle streams like this one are absolutely stuffed with life. There's a good chance I'll be able to pick up an easy source of protein, and hopefully my head net's going to prove it's got more than one use. There we go, that's the sort of thing I'm after, freshwater crayfish and freshwater shrimp. Now they may look small, but survivors can't be choosers. To make fire, all I need is bamboo. The bamboo fire soil was first taught to me by a US Army instructor and it's one of the best tropical survival skills I know. The friction from the sharp edge of the bamboo is all that's needed to ignite the bamboo shavings.
Sometimes you really got to work to get a fire, but it's always worth it because the fire lifts your morale, lifts your spirits, cooks your food, sterilizes your water, and you can even signal with it. Here's my cooking pot. Time to cook these little fellas up. One of the most amazing stories of jungle survival that I know is of a man called Jim Bradley, who during the Second World War was imprisoned on the Thailand to Burma Railway. He had to overcome his fear of the jungle to escape from imprisonment, a journey that took him over eight weeks. I was at one of the worst camps on the railway. We had tremendous deaths through cholera, dysentery, malaria. 1,600 of us walked in, and within three months, uh, 1,200 were dead. My colonel felt that we should try and escape, or someone should try and escape, and bring this to the notice of the outside world. We had to succeed because death was the penalty for anyone escaping. Jim and his fellow escapees had managed to get hold of three machetes, several pounds of rice, and a few tins of sardines. Jim had always planned to escape and had managed to hide a compass from the Japanese prison guards. All we could do was cut a course westwards. We couldn't look for any valleys. There were no tracks to find. We just simply cut and cut westwards. We all had to agree verbally that if we became a casualty, we would have to be left. We had to leave one man who had become so infected with gangrene in his back and he'd become delirious and walked out in the night. We looked for him back along the track, but obviously couldn't waste too much time. And so we had to implement this terrible agreement and leave him. He was a very brave man. This was not to be the only death. By the end of their eight week struggle, five of the original 10 had died. I really remember the absolute moisture, wetness, dampness and darkness with very little hope uh, of ever coming out of it. But we had to keep that hope going. Our worst problem, strangely enough, was bamboo. This was probably about five inches in diameter and very hard to cut through. The main injury were tropical ulcers. Ian Moffat, who was with us, if he had been within reach of medical help, I'm sure they would have amputated both legs. I think he was saved by the fact that maggots came into them and they eat, ate the putrefied flesh. After five weeks, the soldiers had run out of food and were surviving on water alone. The constant wet had given them crippling trench foot and it was becoming excruciating to walk. They also suffered blood-sucking leeches, impossible to stop from penetrating their boots and clothing. Towards the end, the soldiers discovered a river. Too weak to walk, they decided to build a raft from strips of blanket and bamboo. Unfortunately, the raft broke up in some rapids and soon after, the men were discovered on the riverbank by Burmese hunters who betrayed them by selling them back to the Japanese. At the end, we felt we'd spent eight weeks of really extreme hardship and lost five friends. And now we were back in the hands of the Japanese. 
really in a worse position than we were before we left. There's, strangely enough, there isn't a day, even after 55 years, that I don't think about it and realize, in a way, how lucky I was. Um, I think I thought a lot in the jungle that if I got home, I would never expect anything as my right. And that, I think, I have kept to. Jim and his fellow survivors went on to endure two months solitary confinement in a Japanese prisoner of war camp. They were spared execution, partly because the Japanese had such respect for what these courageous men had managed to achieve. This is the biggest bamboo I've ever worked with. Sometimes it's hard to believe that this is a grass, not a tree. I'm gonna use these giant grass stems to get out of the jungle. Rivers are the jungle's natural highways, the place you're most likely to come across help. Like Jim Bradley, I'm going to build a raft to get out. Bamboo is an excellent material for raft building. It's strong, light, and extremely buoyant. Well, it's the moment of truth. In theory, I should be able to float 100 miles or more on a raft like this. But you know how it is. In practice, things don't always work out that way. Here goes. For me, the jungle is a very special place. Living here can be hard, but most people who spend time exploring the jungle become intoxicated by its mystery and lure. If you know what you're doing, survival needn't be an ordeal. I find it exhilarating to be here because the jungle offers such an abundance of natural resources to work with. 